Welcome back for the interactive discussion component of the morning, uh, where we are joined by a special guest, uh, also a good friend of ours, Ribal Al-Assad. Uh, I'd like to say a few words about his background uh, before we begin the interactive discussion. Ribal Al-Assad is the founder and director of the Organization for Democracy and Freedom in Syria. He is an international campaigner for democracy, freedom, and human rights. Ribal, who's now 36, was born in Syria and has lived in the West since being exiled from his country as a child. He brings new ideas and perspectives to campaigning uh, for democracy and freedom in Syria and the Middle East, and is a regular speaker on political and human rights platforms. Ribal regularly interacts with politicians, civil servants, academics, journalists, think tanks, pro-democracy, and human rights groups around the world. Ribal is also chairman of the Iman Foundation, which promotes dialogue to strengthen international understanding and coexistence through the exchange of ideas, people, culture, and religion. He is extensively involved in promoting interfaith dialogue and relations between Muslims, Jews, and Christians around the globe. Over the last years, Ribal has successfully been involved with helping to tackle interreligious and inter interreligious uh, conflict and violence in Lebanon. One of his notable achievements was to help facilitate a rapprochement between the Alawites and the Sunni Muslims in northern Lebanon. Ribal studied politics at Boston University and holds a degree in business studies from the Inter-American University in New York. He's fluent in Arabic, English, French, and Spanish. A keen sportsman uh, with a special interest in Thai boxing, uh, Shaolin Kung Fu, swimming and tennis. Currently lives in London, and uh, I must say uh, I'm really happy to have you here again, Ribal. I mean, Ribal is really one of the strong uh, opponents, let's say, of the current regime in Syria, uh, and has really put his life on the line many times, and actually had actually already several assassination attempts, uh, luckily survived. Uh, so really, somebody fighting, literally, uh, in, the, in the strongest sense of the word, for human rights on a daily basis. So we hope we can continue that contact, that uh, tradition today. Uh, unfortunately, the times are continuously getting more difficult for you and for Syrians, I think, which underlines the importance of your work all the more. So I'm really happy to have you uh, here with us today. Maybe we could give a brief welcome also for Mr. Ribal Al-Assad. Really happy to have you here, and I think it's also a perfect link also to the conference that we're having, uh, Russia and Europe, uh, the Russian-European relationship. If there's one uh, issue that Russia and Europe don't agree on, uh, of course, it's Syria right now, uh, where it's been very difficult to really get uh, the collaboration going. So I wanted to begin this discussion with a question on Syria, maybe towards Ribal, and then I'd like to immediately try to open this up, also make this an interactive discussion. I have a few questions prepared, but I really want to take your questions, also your comments. Uh, first of all, also for Ms. Ujulan, who just gave an excellent lecture. I'm sure you have many uh, follow-up questions for that, as well as also we can uh, make use of the opportunity now to have Ribal here. So let me, I'll begin the conversation with a question on Syria. Uh, the title for this discussion is actually the European-Russian relationship with reference to the crisis in Syria. And the first question is, Ribal, what are your perspectives uh, on the February 2012 Syria resolution, which was vetoed by Russia and China at the United Nations, while the other 13 members voted in favor? Are you for military intervention in Syria? What are the positions of the EU on this matter? Are the long-standing issues between the EU and Russia affecting the resolution of the crisis in Syria? And if we have a microphone also, maybe don't know. Riba. Yes, thank you very much, Mark. It's always a great pleasure to be here at the ICD. And um, let me start by talking about what's uh, happening in, in Syria. Um, regarding the resolution uh, that uh, was vetoed by both Russia and China, um, I honestly think it was very understandable at the time. We have to understand also uh, Russia's interest in, uh, in the region and uh, what Russia and uh, China's uh, relationship with the West uh, and the uh, United States. Uh, to start with, uh, we all know that there is a Russian-U.S. Uh, kind of deadlock uh, now going on over the U.S. Uh, the US missile shields in Europe. And uh, we cannot view the situation in Syria separately in what's, uh, if we don't look at these other issues going on, both between Russia and the uh, United States and NATO and China and uh, the United States and, and uh, of course, and NATO. Uh, people want often... Um, when they talk about Syria, they talk about Syria in, in isolation. I mean, they don't take into effect that Syria is not uh, an isolated country. It's not in the same situation than Libya. Syria has many allies in the region. Uh, you cannot look at what's happening in Syria without looking at what could happen also in Lebanon uh, with allies that Syria has, for example, like Hezbollah and uh, General Michel Aoun, the Syrian National Party in Lebanon, the Ba'ath Party in Lebanon, and others. 
uh, also in, uh, on the other side uh, with Iraq, like the Sadr militias, uh, Al-Maliki and all pro-Iranian uh, alliances, and Iran, of course, with Al-Quds brigades and others. Um, so you see, it's not that as, as easy, you know, and R uh, Russia and China are uh, very aware of that. Uh, that yes, of course they're not backing, they're saying that they are not backing the regime in Syria, but at the same time, uh, you have to take into consideration what could a military intervention lead to in Syria. You know, they are trying to tell the word, the West, that you have to be very careful. This could lead to, to chaos, actually. Uh, President Assad at the time, uh, he came out a few months ago in the newspaper and he said that if anything happens against Syria, there will be an earthquake all over the region. And a regime uh, such as Syria, who's, uh, who knows very well that if they're going to go, they're gonna, they are ready to take the whole region with them. And they're, gonna, they're ready to create chaos. Let's not forget that Syria has a million, uh, half a million army. Uh, they have uh, over 5,000 tanks. They have uh, uh, biological missiles which they moved towards uh, t t uh, Turkey in uh, broad daylight, uh, and they were picked up by U.S. Uh, satellites. Um, so it's not as easy as people are, are seeing it. This is what we're, not, what we're not understanding, that people are not given a chance, for example, to, to the Kofi Annan plan. And uh, also, let's not forget that today we cannot, uh, as I mean, I consider myself as a person who lives in the West, as part of you know, uh, uh, those countries who really believe in, in democracy and uh, and it's, I'm very sad when I see sometimes a duplicity or a, a kind of hypocrisy in treating with, uh, w you know, with uh, what's happening in different areas of the world. Uh, Twenty years ago, it could have worked because we, there was no internet, there was no television channels, uh, satellite television channels. So you could, I mean, each media was uh, really uh, read only or uh, viewed only by the people in, uh, in, in that country. For in the UK, they had television channels which only were viewed in the UK, in France the same, in Syria the same, we had only one television channel. But today, you have television channels in English that are Russians and, uh, <coughs> you know, like Russia Today, you have uh, uh, Iranian television channels in English, uh, like Press TV and others. So, you see, you could always, people are able to check themselves what is happening, how, how there is a duplicity in, in uh, working. Uh, as I always say, if you are for democracy, you have to be for democracy everywhere. And if you are for human rights and freedom, you have to be for human rights uh, uh, and freedom everywhere. You cannot just say, oh, it's specific or selective to a certain country. Uh, and this is what uh, we have to be very careful about today. Uh, again, when uh, Secretary of State, for example, Hillary Clinton came out before the Friends of uh, Syria meeting in Tunisia, uh, a couple of months ago, she came out and, uh, she, I mean, what she said was uh, really amazing. She said, we need a uh, an all-inclusive, uh, democratic, peaceful uh, change in Syria. And just a few days later, at the Friend of Syria meeting, uh, I mean, this is not exactly what happened. They only invited one group of the Syrian opposition. How is that? That proves or shows how democratic was that. Uh, while you have several groups who are not even allowed to participate, our groups was one of them, which sent a delegation there. They were not even allowed near the conference uh, area. Uh, so that, that was hardly inclusive. And this opposition group that was invited to Tunisia were mainly the Islamists, 80% Islamists. And some members of the Syrian National Council came out and said, yes, unfortunately, we are 80% uh, you know, uh, Islamists. Uh, at this, uh, so we, we came out and criticized what happened at the Friend of Syria meeting, and then we had a Friend of Syria meeting in Turkey a month later, and they came out and said, uh, they again invited only the, uh, the Syrian National Council, excluding all other opposition group, and not only that, and they decided also that they should give uh, salaries to the Free Syrian Army, uh, so that shows you again how uh, this is hardly peaceful, as uh, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said. Because when you give salaries to the Free Syrian armies, it's inciting again to more violence. It's creating an army against another army. Uh, and this was just a week after the Kofi Annan plan was announced, which the whole, uh, everybody, the international community came out and backed the, uh, the Kofi Annan plan. I mean, if you back the Kofi Annan plan, you have to act by, all sides have to, uh, to stand by it. They have to back it. Um, and this is what, uh, again, we're, we're having today, is that uh, it's a great, uh, you know, uh, Russia, Russia and China, again, uh, come back to Russia and China, they, 
uh, they want to change, they have backed the Kofi Annan plan, but they also see that on the other hand, there is a, you know, a duplicity in dealing with, the, with certain countries. And they said it openly, we don't want what happened in Libya to be repeated in Syria. Uh, you know, China, let's not also forget that China has their own problem with the U.S., including the, the, you know, the pressure that the United States was putting on China regarding its currencies, the, uh, regarding the, uh, for what China sees as a policy of encirclement by the United States, you know, with the base opening in Australia and uh, courting, uh, you know, Burma. And uh, so they, they, they have their own issues with the U.S., and again, this is what's very worrying, is that we are very worried that there will be proxy battles fought in starting in Syria that would escalate all over the Middle East, and that would be very difficult for anybody to uh, put down that fire at that time. Thank you very much for those insights. I'd like to maybe ask a follow-up question to Ms. Ujiland, uh, coming back to Europe. Uh, to what extent are Russia and the EU uh, involved in the Syrian issue? How does the crisis in Syria affect European-Russian relations? And what role has Russia played in trying to solve the Syrian crisis? Well, um, the Syrian issue is, um, of course, uh, on daily agenda in the, in the parliament and, and also in uh, EIS, um, in the External Action Service, uh, Catherine Ashton is, uh, is very much um, involved in this. Uh, and uh, at the same time, of course, very, uh, this raises uh, huge concerns. It's not only about, um, uh, the concerns are not only about to, to find the solution, but it's uh, very much concerns about uh, these uh, violations and uh, these uh, thousands of deaths of, uh, which are behind this story. And uh, this is very, very much uh, a European concern that how to um, get out of this situation, that to stop the killing. And uh, as uh, we just heard, the interests are so clashy there. And, uh, and, uh, and um, I think that in the West, including the European Union, we may be uh, too uh, less educated, really, to say, to, to put this... Um, picture together to gain back uh, the, the peace. And uh, I think that uh, the position uh, at the same time is clear from the EU side that uh, President Assad uh, should leave. It's uh, impossible, impossible and he should face the international uh, court, uh, the justice, uh, and then the regime should change. Uh, but um, yes, uh, as you were critical that uh, if uh, the West comes to, to assist, uh, to, to help the change, then, uh, then we are quite weak. And I also I can say that uh, apart from my group again, what we, ha what we are doing, how we can um, uh, now um, participating uh, to try to solve the, uh, the situation is that um, we created um, a special representative uh, position. Uh, uh, the person is residing in Cairo, in fact, but uh, this person, uh, on behalf of Alde Group, has the task to um, establish uh, the uh, network uh, between the secular uh, political forces uh, around the region. It's not only about Syria, but also in, in the other uh, countries in the region and in the Northern African countries. We had a recently a meeting at the end of uh, March in Barcelona, where uh, from every country there was uh, one person uh, representing uh, their um, opposition uh, and, and the secular opposition, uh, starting from Morocco, ending up with Syria. So, and, uh, and uh, we, uh, we are planning now the next meeting in, in June, together with them, just to, to, to assist uh, in uh, building, uh, you know, this uh, liberal democratic uh, party networking. This is the concrete things, uh, what, what we try to do at least, and, and I'm personally involved in this also. As I said, I'm spokesperson on, on EU-Russia relations, but I, I also happen to be a spokesperson and a shadow rapporteur on Libya. Before you give up the microphone, just a, a quick follow-up. Last week, Russia and the European Union circulated separate draft UN Security Council resolutions to authorize the deployment of, in Syria of up to 300 more ceasefire observers. How will the observers help resolve the crisis in Syria? How can a peace process be reached in Syria in light of the support from Russia, the EU, and the USA? Well, uh, perhaps it's too difficult question for me, really, because as, as a parliamentarian, I'm not really involved in such a high-level uh, uh, policy making between the big uh, major international players. 
as a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Parliament, of course, we, uh, we, are, we are meeting with Catherine Ashton uh, on a regular basis and, and his office people, and uh, they are, of course, briefing parliamentarians. We can ask the questions, but, but frankly, this is a very uh, uh, specific question, uh, what uh, perhaps the members of governments uh, uh, or the um, executive uh, bodies of the EU could be much um, better persons to, to answer. So just frankly, I, I, I wouldn't be able to, to get uh, to give you a proper answer on, on this. Okay, well in that case, then let me give uh, the same question to Beatrice Bal, if you'd like to, to ask that. And in addition, the final question I have for you, and then I want to give the microphone to you, uh, you could maybe respond in the same way. Does cultural diplomacy have a role to play uh, between the EU-Russian relationship uh, and also with regards to Syria? Is there anything that cultural diplomacy can do in this very difficult situation? First of all, let me say that I welcome the deployment of those, uh, uh, you know, you and. Um, you know, supervisors in, in Syria, it's very important, but the problem is that their job uh, uh, would come to, to nothing if there is not a ceasefire from all sides, from both the government and the parties who, uh, you know, who are supported uh, by some uh, Gulf countries, including Saudi Arabia and Qatar. Um, the problem, t again, today we have to understand is that there is a big sectarian drift in the region, you know, um, between uh, Iran and the support for the Shia Muslims, and between Turkey and the support for the Sunni Muslims in the region. So today, unfortunately, the whole region is divided on sectarian lines. Um, countries in the Gulf have started television channels. One of them is based, for example, in Riyadh, and another one in Cairo, and they <coughs> both incite on religious hatred. They both incite on violence. Uh, you have clerics on Safa and Wissal TV daily calling jihad on minorities, including saying Shias are infidels, Alawites are infidels, uh, and this is, this is today, it's, I mean, the situation is chaotic and it's very uh, difficult to, uh, to sit again and have a diplomatic uh, um, you know, dialogue with the, when sectarian issues, as you know in religion, uh, Religion is very different from politics. In politics, we could fight one day, we could criticize uh, each other, we could uh, you know, uh, have a, a big disagreement, but the next day we could sit back on a table and everything could be resolved. Uh, unfortunately, in religion, it's not the same, and mainly in Islam. And in Islam, once you say about someone, about another person or another uh, Muslim or, another, uh, or Christians or Jewish or whoever, that he's an infidel, an infidel in Islam, they have to, to, for I mean Islamists, for extremist Islamists, they have to kill him. So it's very difficult. How would you sit back with uh, people who have called you an infidel and they have called jihad on you? Like the Chief Justice, uh, the former Chief Justice of Saudi Supreme Council, Sheikh al Haidan, at the beginning of the uprising, he, he said that I called jihad on uh, the Alawites in Syria even if two-thirds of the Syrian population dies. You know, this is uh, hardly uh, acceptable. This, sh this was not uh, condemned by anybody. Uh, and this, is, this has scared all minorities in the Middle East. Uh, again, uh, just a month ago, you have uh, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia who called on burning of all churches in the region. You know, and he said, it's a duty of all Muslims to burn the churches in the region. Well, could you again imagine for all the Christians who, who have suffered in, in, uh, in Iraq, who had to run away from Iraq, and to Christians who are living in Syria, who are 18% um, you know, of the Syrian population, uh, to Christians in, uh, in Egypt and, and all over, you know, what, what the feelings that they're going to have. Of course they're going to side, not because they are pro-dictatorship, but because they are very worried of what's the alternative. If this regime dictatorship, you know, bad dictatorship goes, What's the alternative? Would a theocracy be better than that regime? Of course not. If you look at the Iranian revolution, for example, everybody, they took out a dictator, the Shah of Iran, to be replaced by, uh, you know, by uh, a theocracy, by the uh, Mullah regimes. And is it better now today than you should ask Iranians yourself? Is the regime today, I mean, is the life in Iran today, 30 years after the revolution, is it better than it was under the Shah of Iran? I don't think so. You see, this is where, uh, why is it, it's very difficult today to, to try to resolve the, the, the problem. And I always warned from the beginning that you have to be careful how to, to deal with the Syrian issue because this could lead to a civil war and this could easily 
lead to a regional war. And this is what we're afraid of today, is that it's really looking like that. A year ago, the Iranian regime would never come out openly and say, yes, we will back the regime against whoever. Well, a month ago, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei told uh, Prime Minister, uh, Minister Erdogan that he will defend the Syrian regime. He said it openly. Uh, the uh, Prime Minister, again, of Iraq, Nur al-Malki, who uh, a couple of months ago was, uh, again, he was kind of n never openly saying that he will back the Syrian regime. Today, indirectly, he's telling Turkey, stop intervening uh, uh, and creating sectarian conflicts in the region. You know, so this shows you that everybody is showing their cards today. Before, it was uh, a taboo subject to talk about sectarian issues or, or uh, in, in Islam and uh, uh, sectarian conflict, but today everybody is talking openly about it. And this is why there is a, you know, a great danger in, in that. The problem in the international community and the West, everybody okay, wants to stop the Iranian nuclear program. We all understand that. And, uh, we, we all have, I mean, the whole Ar uh, Middle East, not only the, the, the world, the whole Middle East is worried about the Iranian nuclear program. But at the same time, is the solution to just uh, rush in and uh, try to create chaos in the Middle East or c create a, a, a regional war just to get rid of this, uh, this you know, we'll call the ghost or, uh, you know, the Iranian ghost uh, is that the, the solution? Well, honestly, I don't think so. I think there's only thing that it has to be a diplomatic solution. It has to be, uh, uh, a lot of people ask me, what could we in the West do? I, I, I always tell them, what does it mean? What You could do a lot. Instead of backing one party, you could easily bring all opposition uh, groups, uh, may, uh, ha create a conference, which we were trying to do, I think, a few, few months ago with uh, Mark uh, here, and uh, have a conference, invite all groups, and uh, unify the opposition, you know, and see that, and uh, make sure that this opposition genuinely believes in democracy. Because a lot of people today are trying to play to the Western gallery, and they say, "Yeah, we believe in democracy," and most of them they don't know what it what it means. A lot of members of the Syrian National Council, who are the Muslim Brotherhood, 80% of them are Muslim Brotherhood and Islamists, uh, have lived over 30 years in in the in the West. But you come today and ask them, "What does democracy means to you?" A lot of them think that democracy is about elections or about votes, which is, it's really not. You know, they don't know that it's uh, respecting uh, minorities, it's about religious pluralism, it's about uh, human rights for all, it's about uh, everybody are, uh, are equal under the rule of law. They don't understand that. They think the majority will come, they rule over the others, and, you know, we'll kill all the rest. And you could see it from uh, their website in Arabic, one of their members who has been living in, in the UK for over 30 years, he writes that I wish there is, you know, there is an earthquake that would kill every Alawite, including their children, their babies, their mothers, their elderly. You know, that, that's scary. That this is extremely scary. And when you see that these are the people that are backed today by the whole international community, well, this is even sc scarier. We want the international community to unify the opposition, and then peacefully to corner the Syrian regime, who is saying today, "Oh, we are ready for dialogue." We know very well that they cannot have dialogue because dialogue or reforms for them means their end. But at least they're saying it. Russia and China are saying, you know, the Syrian regime is ready for dialogue. Why don't we unify the opposition and let's have dialogue that will be supervised by the international community and move towards a uh, democratic transition, move towards national unity government, move towards uh, pluralism, and then we'll, you know, uh, the next elections are uh, in 2014. You know, we have to, I mean, this issue could only be resolved in that way, in that manner, in diplomatic manner. Militarily, it's going to be chaos, and it's going to bring disaster. And this is where I think cultural diplomacy could play a role, is trying to, 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 uh, uh, to bring those people together, you know, bringing people and listening to what people have to say. Minorities who are terrified today in the Middle East, but what could be the alternative? People have seen, for example, what happened in Tunisia. People have seen what happened in Libya. People have seen what happened in, in Egypt. Okay, the dictatorship is gone. What happened in Egypt today? You have the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood who won the first, uh, you know, the, the, the first party in, in, par in Parliament, and then the second party are the Salafis. You know, what about the 10 percent of Coptic Christians? What about the moderates who went out, you know, went out during the revolution and were filling Tahrir Square? What happened to those people? Just because they were not organized? 
they couldn't get, uh, you know, um, they couldn't be represented because they were not organized, because they were not able to organize under the previous regime, because they don't have uh, economic backing from countries. Because as you know, uh, go, uh, uh, countries in the Gulf are only willing to back Islamists. And you know, money plays a huge part today. Again, in Tunisia, it's the Islamists who have won the elections. And in Libya, in Libya, the NATO strikes came, and then they left. And they left people now on the ground to decide their own fate. They armed everybody, the Qataris armed everybody. And okay, great, now pro-Qaddafi, against Qaddafi, all tribes kill each other, you know. And this is disastrous. This now we could see some, uh, uh, I think uh, there was a region, uh, the Benghazi region, they have declared that they want to have uh, an autonom uh, autonomous region in, uh, in, in Libya. Uh, and unfortunately, this is, a, this is a region where all the oil is. So this is going to create greater conflict. You see, this is very, very difficult. We are in a very difficult uh, position today all over the Middle East. And if the international community doesn't come and, as uh, uh, you know, uh, Mark said, and uh, dip uh, cultural diplomacy needs to play a role into uh, helping all uh, groups, all uh, groups who genuinely believe in democracy, all secular groups. You know, and it cannot be just, uh, uh, as you said, man, just one, one person representing each country. It has to be, there's many groups in the Middle East. There's not one person who could represent Egypt or one party that could uh, represent the secular groups in Egypt. Why? Because they were never able under uh, President Mubarak or under the dictatorship to organize themselves. You know, they have, uh, you have to open the way for everybody, for all people who believe in real uh, secular regimes to come along. You, they need training, they need uh, uh, to, to learn how to build civil society, they need to learn uh, how to uh, build democratic parties, and they don't have that, uh, that training, unfortunately. You know, this is, ve this is very important. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, actually, that took longer than I had planned, but I think it was very important, actually, the, the insights that you both gave us. I really appreciate that. What I'd like to do now, though, is take maybe a tour of the room. I know I'm sure there are many questions here, uh, far too many probably for the time, but let's take maybe five, six different voices, uh, in particular the Russian participants. Uh, we didn't have such a, such a chance to hear from you today. Uh, maybe we could have the Russian participants first. Uh, I'd love to maybe take you know, a brief, let's say, 30 seconds comment or question from each of you, uh, and then I'd ask maybe each of the panelists to offer responses to those questions or points that are relevant uh, to you. So Thank you. Uh, my name is Konstantin Leshenko. I'm from St. Petersburg State University. Um, I would like to raise a question to Ms. Oilund. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my question is going to be about small differences. There's a um, couple of uh, books considerable in Russian literature uh, named What to Do. Uh, and if I try to summarize your presentation in that sense, what to do, it is like impose sanctions, um, foster democracy through all the possible means, uh, and well, try, try to not align with the existing Russian regime. Uh, on the other hand, as you indicated, there is a distinction line between the economic way of uh, things are going and the political way of things are going, because uh, economists and businessmen clearly consider Putin as a more stable person to talk to. Uh, we can indicate it like the rise of um, stock index of Russian RTS and MMVB after the Putin's been elected again, um, like uh, defreezing of economic activities in Russia after he came to power again. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, these were, uh, of course, not democratic elections. Uh, we can all say that. But then again, if I can remember 1996, when Yeltsin was elected uh, again, that was even less democratic elections than it was by now. And the question of differences is like the attitude of a European Union and the countries of European Union to the situation. Because I can remember my parents sitting in front of a television and nearly praying uh, not to, for communists not to come back. And it was clear to all because Yeltsin had a rating about 6% two months prior to the elections and then he's been elected. Nearly everyone understood it was falsified. Um, Nevertheless, no reaction from West, no, no reaction from Europe, nearly uh, not, not that big. Now there is a big reaction uh, in the attitude to, to this election that happened, and not least uh, back in the op opposite parties that, uh, opposition parties that are clearly being led by even more corrupt people that are in the power of Russia right now. There are a lot of instances. And uh, we can consider backing of Alexei Navalny from the National Endowment for Democracy from the U.S., for instance. They, 
um, none of the Russian person uh, who knows that would really appreciate this uh, of a man coming to power being backed from US or whatever from outside and you can consider also these people uh, the leaders of opposition going to US embassy uh, to have some consultations just a couple of days before the elections as well um, I don't want I don't want to name personalities but uh, believe me all the representatives of all the opposition parties whether represented in Duma or not represented in Duma they were there so the question is why, why these small differences of the attitudes of the West to, towards the, uh, what's happening in Russia? Thank you. Hi, I'm Kimberly. I'm from The Hague, the Netherlands. And I also have a question for uh, Ms. Ogiland, uh, because you said that uh, it is an aim of uh, the European Union to have uh, sort of a do-over of the elections. Uh, but many political scientists, for instance, uh, Levitsky and Wei, and also others who are really specialized in Russian politics, they think that it was not so much uh, the fraud, but the unequal television coverage that was the main influence. So what would be the time frame if, for instance, Parnas participated? In what time frame would you want to have new elections? And what are the expectations that they would really have a majority or not? Because many Russians do have support for Putin. Thank you. Who would like to go next? Uh, I have a question also to Madam Ulan uh, regarding uh, uh, your um, quote about uh, the European Union wanting to put the uh, human rights issue more up to the agenda when speaking to the Russian Federation. And my question would be, is it really realistic uh, to say that the European Union had and would take into consideration alternative suppliers of natural resources? Because, yeah, that's a question, thank you. Uh, my name is Hannah and I'm from Ireland. My question is to Mr. Rabil. Uh, I'm wondering how, uh, you spoke about um, like a democratic and peaceful understanding uh, in the Middle East and um, how uh, important it is. So I'm wondering how, um, this would be possible or how realistic it is when Iran is, is uh, can be argued as so undemocratic, uh, with in particular in the 2009 elections. So I'm wondering what your opinion is of the future of the region and Syria with Iran's grasp on, on Syria in particular. I'm Ashwat Avdisyan from Yerevan Center for Democracy and Peace. Uh, as we know, there are big, huge, even Armenian communities in all over the world, and especially Iran, Iraq, Syria. Uh, there was a small one in Libya. So my question for both of you, and I would like to see a kind of guaranteed answer for those communities, churches, and whatever there. Uh, what's the guarantee from the West for those minorities in those countries? And the second one, uh, to Mr. Rival, uh, what's the uh, perception of local opposition uh, powers, like you are representing, uh, towards those small minorities and their role in all this situation? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's say ladies first, uh, Ms. Arjuna. Okay. This is always ladies first, <laughs> especially when it comes to the uh, answers. <laughs> Okay, well, the, well uh, yes, I agree. In 96, um, uh, these uh, elections of um, presidential elections, uh, they, they were not uh, fully uh, fair elections. Uh, these are reported in all reports in OSCE, in the Council of Europe. I was observing myself those elections in Russia in 96 uh, as an observer from the Council of Europe Parliamentary Assembly, and, and uh, we, we fixed it, of course. These, uh, these were not... Um, uh, fully satisfactory elections, but at the same time it was the time when Russia was succeeding um, to the Council of Europe. And uh, then uh, I would say, uh, at least in the Council of Europe, there was uh, the expectation that um, when the country is a member of the organization, still there is a perspective to learn democracy, to become a democratic, to, to um, implement the 
common values and, and common rules. And uh, still the, the time of uh, Yeltsin, uh, or the period of Yeltsin uh, Russia, this was still very high expectations in the West that uh, Russia may become a democracy. They may make may mistakes, but still even if that was, uh, well, the, the problem with the, <laughs> with, the, with the fear competition, still there were expectations that uh, something can be changed with the help and assistance with West and international organizations like uh, the Council of Europe. Um, and yes, and nowadays Russia. But, but, but I think that the, as I said, it's it's uh, it's um, it's absolutely changed. It's a different regime. It's not like uh, Yeltsin time regime. It was chaotic and there were a lot of problems. But now this regime, the Putin's regime, is is absolutely different one. It's very strong, and it's very uh, hungry to really keep their power, not to not to leave it uh, to anybody through the democratic elections. And uh, this is the major difference. And speaking about the leaders, I agree with you that uh, the old opposition leaders, and you will meet uh, the one uh, in, in these uh, meetings also soon, uh, I don't also have uh, high expectations uh, with, with them. Of course, they do their job in the moment, like Mr. Kasyanov, Mr. Rushkov, and Emtsov. Uh, but uh, what I think is really Russia would need a new leader younger generation leader. There are some young people, maybe they are too young, like Yashin and, um, and Nevalny, maybe he's not really a politician, but Yashin is definitely. Um, uh, 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 that is not only about the leader who can take people behind uh, uh, himself, but also the program, the political program. And even the old leaders now, I would say, they still uh, lack the clear political program and vision uh, to what they really want to uh, achieve. It's not only enough just when they say that Putin should leave the office. They should have the vision for the country and, uh, and for the people. So uh, now... Um, mm. Ah, yes, the time frame for the new elections. Uh, what uh, what uh, what uh, European Parliament and other international organizations have said, it's not only European Parliament, but also OSCE has said that, uh, that Russia needs uh, new uh, free and fair elections. Uh, we, we cannot set the timetable. We have said simply as soon as possible, but, uh, but I'm uh, quite uh, pessimistic. I don't think they will have a new elections. Or as uh, the ambassador of Russian Federation in Brussels, Mr. Chisov, said to me when I asked him, uh, in another uh, hearing in the Foreign Affairs Committee when he had a meeting with us, I asked when uh, you expect that Russia will have new uh, free and fair elections, and he said, just be calm, uh, we will have next elections in five years. Uh, so, uh, uh, which is pity, of course, but, um, but still, I think that Russian people, those who came to the streets in December and uh, to February, and, and I, I guess that now, before the inauguration in May, there will be another a wave of uh, major demonstrations still there are so many people uh, who are not backing Putin if you s if you say that uh, yes Putin is broadly supported yes and no uh, because uh, if there were free and fair presidential elections I'm not really sure if he could uh, make uh, those elections in second tour if for example Yavlinsky was led to the elections then I would, uh, I would say that even Yavlinsky is not the person who is uh, gathering uh, the opposition in the moment behind uh, his back. But if that was the case uh, in March, that, uh, that he had a chance to go to the elections, he could get, in my view, a lot of um, uh, votes uh, of those who were really against Mr. Putin. And basically, Russians, uh, Russian people didn't have a really relevant choice uh, between to choose. They didn't want to choose uh, Shirinovsky or, or Chukanov. It's, it's clear. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, history. Yesterday's, his, uh, yesterday's day. So, uh, natural resources, uh, the alternatives. Uh, well, uh, I think that the situation uh, in general is, is not, uh, uh, not that bad. I think, frankly speaking, this uh, little, little bit um, uh, probably um, uh, changed the European policy planning uh, when in uh, Libya uh, uh, the situation has changed because uh, uh, I think that there was some planning to, to also to to, to get more alternative um, uh, resources from the Middle East, including Libya, by the way. 
but, uh, but there is also Turkmenistan with whom uh, uh, the, the uh, European Union has been uh, negotiating and, and always, always the question of, uh, <laughs> again, on the one hand, like it's quite similar like with Russia. Uh, you, you, you need the natural resources and at the same time you, you face uh, this uh, very unpleasant uh, situation with, uh, with the human rights, the lack of democracy. Uh, and and uh, this, is, uh, this is the reality, but, um, but nevertheless, just to spread uh, the um, uh, risks uh, between those countries like Russia, like Turkmenistan or um, some other countries in the Arab Arabic world who are not democratic, um, uh, we, we, we don't have any, any, any other way out uh, so far. Uh, we, we need this uh, natural um, uh, gas and, and, uh, and, and oil. And as I said, we are just also, uh, as you know, the EU has this plan 2020-20, which means that 20% uh, more efficiency in energy use, 20% uh, uh, of uh, using more uh, uh, alternative uh, resources, energy resources, etc. So uh, it's, it's a, like a, a mm, parallel process uh, with what uh, EU is, uh, is, uh, is dealing and of course with these all electricity cars which are now running in our streets <laughs> I guess in also in Berlin and, and uh, some, some, uh, some more alternatives. And uh, last but not least, um, what kind of guarantees uh, Europe can take for the minorities in, uh, in, uh, in the Middle East? I don't see any, any real guarantees what I can say that we guarantee this or that or, or this. I think that uh, what happened, it was uh, the Arab Spring, um, uh, what happened, uh, it was, um, it was uh, mysterious really also that it happened so fast. It was uh, backed by so many people, especially young people, and uh, such a high hopes were up there. And uh, it's now, I think it's very difficult to understand where, where was, in which moment really, the, the, the momentum was uh, lost. Uh, to uh, really uh, build and, and guarantee that the democracy is, uh, is uh, taking place instead of uh, this, uh, what we have seen now in Egypt, for example. It was a, it was a big, um, of course, um, uh, un, un, um, uh, unexpected development, I would say, and at the same time, uh, speaking Tunisia, you see, Tunisia has succeeded to, to get uh, much in better situation. I think in Tunisia the, the minorities are not under the threat. Uh, so it, sh it shows that still it is possible that uh, the Arab countries uh, are not a priori undemocratic. Uh, we are nobody is born as a democrat and, and in many, many countries, even in Europe, uh, people uh, can learn democracy in my own country who was living uh, 50 years uh, in the totalitarian system uh, I was uh, I was not taught as a Democrat when uh, when I started to work uh, for Estonia we are all learning and that means that also there is a perspective in in Arab world in Tunisia they they are doing this uh, is a good uh, model good example and uh, and uh, and I very much would like to agree with you what you said that maybe it's really uh, it's very very central uh, to focus to um, have a more closer dialogue and uh, teaching uh, trying to to teach uh, the leaders uh, of uh, democratic and secular opposition uh, to to. Uh, to be prepared uh, to take over and to uh, bring uh, democracy uh, on, on, on your region in, in these countries. It's not about uh, taking sort of European values necessarily there, but it's about the freedoms and democracy, human rights, which are universal, should be universal. Let me first answer the question about uh, Iran, what to do about uh, stopping Iran from uh, what they're doing. Well. Um, the solution, I don't think that the solution is to in, uh, divide the region on sectarian lines because that's what I, would be really chaotic and, and disaster, that would bring disaster to the whole region. Um, you know, but the problem, as, you know, as I explained before, a um, lot of minorities live in the Middle East. Uh, 
the solution to countering Iran would be to promote all democratic parties in Iran, in all over the Middle East, genuine democratic parties to promote them, to help them, to uh, educate them. Uh, there, there's many ways. It's, it's not the only way is not to just create sectarian conflict, you know, because then that nobody would be able to stop it, and it will be much worse than uh, having, uh, you know, just. Uh, Iran having their uh, nuclear program, of course, would be disastrous. But cre to create sectarian conflict, it would be uh, really a disaster because that would include all the countries in uh, in the Middle East, from North Africa to the uh, to the Middle East to Iran. Uh, it could even drag Pakistan. It could drag uh, uh, Muslims from all over the world. And this is really, really dangerous. You know, China is very worried about it because, as you know, they have problem with Muslims. In, uh, uh, in, in China, uh, Russia is worried about it because they had uh, problems in Chechnya and Dagestan, and there were many Al-Qaeda members sent there. Um, the same in Afghanistan, the same uh, in, in India, and if you've seen the, the last bombing that happened in, in India. And uh, so all the countries in the area are really worried about Islamists coming to power. You know, the way to defeat Iran is certainly not by creating another Islamist uh, entity to fight Iran. That would be, uh, as I said, very, uh, you know, a disaster. Iran, yes, controls a lot of things in, uh, you know, because they use uh, the Shias, the Arab Shias in the Middle East to say that we are here, the champions of the Shias, we are here to help the Shias in the Middle East, uh, in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, in, uh, in, in Bahrain, in Saudi Arabia, all over. Yes, but th the solution is not by creating uh, as I said, another uh, force saying, oh, and we are going to back the Sunnis against the Shias in the Middle East. You know, the, the, the only solution, as I said, is to bring real, genuine democratic forces, you know, that will be able to change. And there are many Iranians, you know, who are pro-democracy, as we have seen a few years ago. But the problem, those Iranians who went out, uh, who went out in the streets of Tehran and all over uh, Iran, they didn't see uh, real support. You know, they saw a bit of support in the media. Other than that, they didn't see a lot of support. And again, the same in, uh, in Syria. For the past uh, years, there were, there were some uh, democratic parties. Uh, but again, they didn't see any uh, who tried, I mean, to, to, to talk about changes and dem democratic changes, like, uh, you know, ourselves. Uh, I used to run the Arab News Network, which is the first television channel in the Middle East uh, to promote democracy and freedom in Syria and all over the Middle East. You know, we never... S s uh, saw or met anyone who was uh, willing to support, uh, to support us or any other democratic party. When our house got bombed in Latakia in 1999, uh, a year before Bashar took over, there was all over the Western media, the Western media was backing uh, Bashar al-Assad. Nobody came out and said, oh, uh, uh, how many people died in that uh, house in Latakia? Where, were, uh, wh where did these 250 people disappear at the time who were there? There were 50 women, 200 men. Nobody talked about it. Everybody followed the, the regime's version at the time who came out and said we attacked an illegal port uh, belonging to uh, Dr. Rifat al-Assad, and everybody just you know, followed. You know, it was the Western media who gave a lot of support for uh, Bashar al-Assad. There was a, a, a British media and other Western media who said Bashar al-Assad was British educated, uh, he was a reformer, uh, if you remember at the time, uh, Secretary of State Madeleine Albright went to Syria uh, and she, you know, uh, so in sh showing support for President Bashar. Uh, you had also uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair, you had uh, President Chirac, you had uh, King of Jordan, uh, Ab King Abdullah, who was a very close friend uh, of his. Uh, uh, Saudi showed support for him. Uh, the Qataris had, uh, were supporting him even through Al Jazeera in the media. So. This is what, what really happens, is one day they support a dictatorship, you know, and the other day they switch and start supporting Islamists. They, they, there's no middle ground, you know. As I said, the, the alternative to a dictatorship doesn't have to be Islamists. You know, they could be d democratic parties, and they have to be, not only they could be, they should be the democratic parties who have been suffering from those dictatorships for ages, just they were not able under dictatorship to organize. Islamists were able to organize because they use the mosques, they use, uh, uh, to, I mean, to meet and to organize themselves. Uh, they use uh, uh, the funds, the Islamic funds to, to fund their, uh, their activities, uh, while other democratic parties are not allowed. You've seen in Egypt, the, the Muslim Brotherhood were very well organized. They were a very strong party, even under Mubarak. 
uh, but other parties, democratic parties, whenever they would try to go to the street or whenever they tried to oppose the regime, they were all put in jail. They were all arrested and put in jail. You know, the same as in Tunisia, the same as in uh, Libya, the same as in, uh, uh, you know, in, in Syria, everywhere, really, everywhere, that's a, the that's a case, and unfortunately. And on the question about uh, Armenians, um, this is again the, the, the mistake that the West did, is delegating their responsibilities to Ankara. You know, we all remember under the, and all Syrians, all Middle Eastern do remember, under the Ottoman Empire, uh, you know, how many minorities they killed, Christians, uh, you know, uh, Alawites, Druze, Shias, and, and many others. They killed many, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of minorities. So it was very, I think, naive from the West or international community to uh, delegate the responsibilities to Ankara, who had the first opposition uh, to uh, meeting in, uh, and they have created actually where, where exactly the Syrian National Council was created. It was created in Turkey, and it's 80 percent, as I said, Islamist. So of course, that uh, there alone you are uh, creating, I mean, uh, animosity with. Uh, the Christians in Syria, 18%, because as you know, Armenians are also Christians, and uh, all Christians usually they tend to, uh, you know, s to stick together, which is normal. You know, they, they, as I said, they have all suffered under the Ottoman Empire. Uh, again, uh, uh, the Kurds, who are uh, around 20% of, of Syria, again have uh, felt that they have been excluded because the Kurdish certainly they don't think that it's Turkey who's gonna. Uh, uh, try to help them get democracy and have a pluralist Syria. Uh, so that's uh, together Christians and Kurds alone are like 40%. And then you have, of course, other minorities who, again, same as the, the Alawites, who have suffered a lot under the Tur uh, Ottoman Empire, and we had over 100,000 killed. Uh, uh, they were killed by, uh, it was known as the Khazuqs of Sultan Selim, you know. And uh, and the, the, the all, all the minorities in, in Syria and the Middle East do remember that. So it was, I think, uh, again, it was a big mistake to delegate that to Turkey. And it, is, uh, uh, it, has, uh, it has forced all minorities in Syria to uh, side with the regime without really believing in, in it. People should know that Christians, Alawites, Shias, Sunnis, the Druze, uh, everybody in Syria. Shia, everybody in Syria wants democracy. Nobody could believe that anyone in, uh, in the world wants to live without democracy or without freedom. You know, this is, uh, as I said, these are universal values. God created us free, so everybody feels that this is, nobody could take uh, away from them that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, freedom. But at the same time, uh, they do not, uh, as I said, they're very worried what could be, there's not a viable alternative. Because we have a very, uh, is, uh, we have an Islamist opposition, uh, non-inclusive opposition, uh, non-unified opposition, and uh, an opposition that's honestly very immature and it's very undemocratic. I mean, how helpful could it be, after what we have seen what happened in Iraq, to have Syrian opposition, a Syrian uh, opposition come out and say, you know, we want this Ba'athist regime in Syria out. You know, I don't know if m some of you know, but in Syria we have two, over two million Ba'athists in, uh, you know, who are part of uh, the regime. And Ba'athists are from all uh, sects, from all religions, from all ethnicities. You know, and they are, they are uh, Ba'athists not because they believe in the Ba'athist principles, but be because usually uh, you get, a, you know, if you are Ba'athist in Syria, you are the first to get a job. You know, and they should have learned from Iraq you know, when, uh, when the, I mean, they invaded Iraq and they told the Ba'athists, they, you know, they dismantled the Ba'ath party and they dismantled the armed forces. This is the chaos that's, uh, that, you know, we've been seeing in Iraq for the past 10 years. And this is going to be again repeated in Syria if we don't learn from our mistakes and if we don't include everybody. We have to tell, uh, you know, uh, we have to convince the people in Syria, all minorities, all sects, all ethnicities, all religions, including the Ba'ath Party, including people who are in the regime, that don't worry, you will be included in a democratic system. You will all be included. You know, uh, there wouldn't be any sect who will be uh, taken, uh, you know, there wouldn't be any revenge taken uh, against any sect or against any religion, against any ethnicity, against any political party, or against any people who, are, uh, who have served in this regime or the previous regime. You know, because if not, those people will stick, and they ha this is what they have been doing. They have been sticking with the regime. 
They have been sticking and fighting, not because you know, of the love they have for Bashar al-Assad. It's just because they are defending their lives and their interests. You know, they are very worried about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, so I'd like to ask all of you to please join me in expressing our sincere gratitude to both of the panelists for, I think, a very thought-provoking discussion. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.